Hi there. Um, I just I want to say a big thank you to Katie and Vernon and Jim for thinking of me, calling me, asking me to participate today, um, and to all of you for coming from far and wide uh, to join us for this kind of weirdly fun conference. <laughs> it's, it's all good. I'm having fun. I hope you are. Um, so. We're here today because we understand that when we research and write about American communism, we're entering an arena where the stakes are high. Wars hot and cold have been fought. People gave their lives, others had them taken, and untold money was spent for the cause and to defeat the party altogether. In the end, the movement had an enormous impact on America's political shift to the right, as well as to movements that flourished on the left. And today, in Trump's America, the history of American communism resonates. In the weeks leading up to the midterm election, the Trump administration released a 72-page report published by the Council of Economic Advisors attacking socialism. The report threatened that a democratic sweep in the midterms would likely result in the US becoming the next Venezuela. Dun, dun, dun. The report honed in on the likelihood that Democrats would force government-run health care down the throats of American citizens, ultimately draining national coffers. A subsection of the report titled, The Socialist Economic Narrative, Exploitation Corrected by Central Planning, connects the messaging of Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren with Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, and Mao Zedong. The socialism that appears un-American in the depictions offered by Trump and his followers takes on a different cast among today's socialists who are inspired by Occupy Wall Street and the Bernie Sanders campaign. The Democratic Socialists of America, now larger than the Socialist Party ever was and approaching the numbers of the Communist Party, are looking to the history of socialism generally and the American Communist Party specifically and they're asking questions about what worked in the past and what didn't. They want to learn from the old left's organizing strategies and worldview and to understand why the US and the anti-communist left turn so fiercely on communists. The significance of our work is clear. So is its timeliness. In the United States and across the globe, rural and urban communities are confronting challenges brought by globalization, ethnic and racial nationalisms, and stark economic inequality. While distressing, these economic, political, and social realities create an opportunity for us to approach the history of American communism with new questions and interpretations that go beyond those framed in the context of the Cold War and that will more directly speak to a new generation of students and activists. When in the 1930s, the police were getting ready to evict an African-American family on Chicago's South Side, an African-American mother turned to her son and according to St. Clair Drake and Horace Caton, demanded that he run quick and find the Reds to help keep them in their apartment. In our enthusiasm to run quick and find the Reds, we have each written a piece of their story but we have yet to fully integrate into a broader narrative insights brought to us through sources available through the late 1990s. We have yet to fully engage the larger narrative that drives the survey of US history, and we have yet to fully bring 21st centuries to bear on the history of American communism. American communism's historiography is filled with examples of scholars using their sources to wage inwardly focused and partisan battles. I don't expect any of us will live long enough to see the end of this practice. But new sources and the current shift in the geopolitical landscape provides an opportunity for our field to move in a direction that will build on its strong foundation of serious empirical scholarship and speak more broadly to the impact of the CPUSA and communists on the United States and American forms of democracy and the movement's connection to ideas, people, and movements throughout the world. In doing so, we have much to offer students of American history who often don't learn about communism in the United States until they meet Joseph McCarthy in the, in the post-World War II period and then in a way that is episodic and out of context. We have much to share today, uh, to share with today's progressives who are looking for a usable history of anti-capitalist and anti-racist movements.
And we have a real opportunity to breathe new life into this subfield, which has been disengaged from the larger field of US history for some time. Today, I'd like to start building toward that synthetic, outwardly facing interpretation by exploring where we've been and considering where we're poised to go. Um, so first, in broad strokes, I'd like to discuss where we've been by outlining the general contours of the two main camps that define the historiography through the early 1990s, and most of us, this is familiar ground. The first was formed in the late 1950s when the Fund for the Republic sponsored the 10 book Communism in American Life series. Most in this series were written in spite of the fact that little source material existed. The historical questions framed the studies were shaped in the larger context of the Cold War and by scholars' political experiences. Theodore Draper's two volumes, The Roots of American Communism and Commu American Communism in Soviet Russia, stand out as two of the most important works in this period, in part due to Draper's efforts in interviewing ex-communists and tracking down internal as well as party sources. Draper, trained at New York's City College in philosophy, began his political career there in the National Student League and the Young Communist League. He later worked for the Daily Worker and then the New Masses. Moscow's changing line in the period of the Nazi-Soviet pact personally stung Draper, who predicted that after the fall of France, Nazis would soon turn on the Soviets. When they did and party policy shifted, Draper had enough. In 1942, he left the party disgusted. What began in his 1957 volume as a critical engagement with evidence and a claim that, quote, Communism was not merely what happened in Russia, it was just as much what was happening in the United States, moved by 1960 to a more one-sided view. Draper writes, quote, whatever has changed from time to time, one thing has never changed, the relation of American communism to Soviet Russia. This relation has expressed itself in different ways, sometimes glaring and strident, sometimes masked and muted, but it has always been the determining factor the essential element. Draper's anti-communism, like many in this first group of communist scholars writing in the 50s and 60s, reflected personal experiences in ugly political battles with communists and their allies. These scholars, many of whom were former New Deal liberals and socialists, became convinced that communist totalitarian ideology was so central to the movement that one only needed to understand the decisions of party leaders to understand the movement which in the end, they determined, was fundamentally un-American and illegitimate. Despite their ideological endgame, some of these pioneering studies, especially Draper's, include valuable information about the political and organizational history of the American Communist Party and its leaders. And while overstated and underdeveloped, Draper's attention to Stalinism and to the Marxist-Leninist structure of the party continues to be important to those of us interested in labor and working class history, the revolutionary hopes of working people, and the organizational expectations and challenges of this Marxist-Leninist movement. A second camp of scholars came of age in the late 60s and 70s and found themselves drawn to the history of ordinary people and the sources they create and the scholarship of E.P. Thompson and Herbert Gutman. They relied on oral history, published party materials, newspapers, organizational records, and personal papers co to contextualize American communism and depict it as a form of authentic American radicalism. Their studies explain how individuals and groups experienced communism in places as disparate as the Midwestern shop floor, Southern farm, and Eastern city, and among all manner of ethnic and racial groups, professions, athletes, artists, writers, and they reveal an American landscape where communists had more prominence than standard US histories allowed or acknowledged. These scholars often ask similar questions. Why did people in these different places and periods become communists? What was the party's appeal? They also wanted to know what communists accomplished. And I, and I mean accomplished because this group of scholars was interested in the ways that capitalism unequally distributed the experience of democracy throughout American society and history. 
In their studies, communists bring attention to the various ways in which the ideal of American democracy did not mesh with different groups' reality. Communists, to these scholars, also represent a tradition of militant radicalism in America that speaks to uniquely American problems, such as a deep history of structural racism and enduring nativism. In their enthusiasm, they drew upon their political experiences and romanticized the communist movement by understating the common turns damaging role, dismissing the party's bureaucratic structure, and downplaying the movement's sectarianism. And yet, these, st these studies humanized the movement and documented the wide reach and significance of communist activism in American society. The most important works influenced by this revisionist wave of scholarship attempted to make sense of American communism in relation to the common turn and party directives. Works such as Robin Kelly's Hammer and Ho and Mark Solomon's The Cry Was Unity, for example, pushed our thinking about ways that seemingly nonsensical party theory made sense to the most disenfranchised. We learn that in places like Birmingham, Alabama, every negative report about Yankees or outsiders further endeared African Americans to these people who they believed could overthrow capitalism and white supremacy. These authors uncovered evidence that effective organizing was possible, even in the context of incredible poverty. That ideas about racism are changeable, and that collective struggle is a powerful force for social change. They showed how significant the international movement was in bringing worldwide attention to Angelo Herdman's conspiracy charges and the Scottsboro case, and the ways that the party placed local and potentially isolated struggles into a global context that pointed to capitalism as a system with alternate paths. A 1985 exchange in the New York Times Review of Books between Theodore Draper and Morris Isserman air the differences between the two camps in a politicized and personal way that solidified the scholarly divide. To Draper, New Left scholars downplayed the extent to which the American communist movement was a political satellite of Soviet Russia. For the next decade, historical questions in the subfield stagnated around this question. To what extent was American communism controlled by Soviet Russia? In the early 1990s, the subfield was re-energized with the opening of Moscow's archives. In the rush to examine the newly available sources and run quick and find the reds, new insights emerged. Um, and for the next two decades, I would say scholarship developed in what I've defined as three general broad categories, directions. The first direction includes a good portion of the recent work and is most influenced by diplomatic and political questions and methodological approaches to party history. It's most like the original Draper camp in its attention to leaders, party structures, and Soviet control, um, but not always with the same ideological overtones. Most of the scholars on this path draw on the Venona Project, KGB records, and collections within the Moscow archives that reveal high-level party machinations. Their histories re-emphasize the autocratic nature of the International Communist Party and its manifestation in the American Party and bring to the fore American communists' participation in espionage work. John Haynes, Harvey Clare, Katie Sibley, Thomas Sackmeister, Steve Usden, to name a few, provide evidence that, for example, leaders of the CPUSA created fake passports. They and Soviet operatives recruited individuals for espionage work, arranged safe houses and business fronts for Soviet agents. After Nazi Germany attacked the Soviet Union, party leaders helped organize networks of US government workers to provide military and diplomatic information of interest to the Soviet Union. These scholars tend to focus more fully on individual action rather than on larger historical context or individuals' motivations. Um, and now that this kind of connections between espionage work and the CPUSA leadership uh, are clearer, some in this uh, group are calling for revision to our understanding of liberal anti-communism. 
Other scholars in this path, so we're still on the first direction in that same group, um, to take a, a political top-down approach, focus on the relationship um, more closely between the common turn and the American party. Jacob Zuma, for example, argues that in the early 1920s, the common turn was overwhelmingly a positive influence on its American followers. Its leaders pushed to Americanize the large number of foreign language speaking American groups. They demanded in 1921 that dueling parties merge and operate above ground, and they put a special emphasis on African American oppression. Finding support for Brian Palmer's earlier interpretation of Stalinization, Zumoff documents a changing relationship between the common turn and the American party, one that becomes Stalinized over time. James Barrett, on the other hand, um, who I have a warm spot for, which we can talk about later, um, and he is sorry he can't be here today. Um, cautions against Zumoff and Palmer's focus on Stalinization's rise in the late 1920s, and argues that Stalinization preceded the rise of Stalin, and that the common turn, dominated by Soviet influences, caused the CPUSA to make catastrophic mistakes from the 1920s through the 1950s. To Barrett, the common turn model was unnecessary and an impediment to the revolutionary left. Quote, wrapped in the tragedy of the Russian Revolution itself is a tragedy of American radicalism, shaped by an international organization designed to export the Russian achievement to societies around the world. The common turn often made it much more difficult to build an effective radical party in the United States. These scholars are looking at two sides of the same coin. Zumoff is interested in roads not taken and revolutionary moments of possibility. Barrett's describing the fundamental tragedy he sees in the American communist movement's relation to the common turn. Staying true to the methods and questions that animated the field since its, its inception, scholars in this first group determine new, uh, examine new sources to answer previously unsettled questions and to offer a fuller picture of international politics that structure the movement. A second direction in this most recent period includes scholars who use new party sources to document local communist organizations to understand why people joined the movement and what they ultimately did in their communities. Circling back to questions framed by revisionist scholars of the 1980s, these scholars take um, what Vernon Peterson calls a more blended approach to American communism bringing together realities of the international organization with a sharpened attention to local contexts and people. Studies focus on African Americans, women, Yiddish speakers, Chinese and Japanese immigrants, communists in regions throughout the country, um, and sometimes on individual party leaders. My own work in Chicago found that during the third period, leaders wanted to recruit from among native-born employed industrial workers but they took what they got. They instructed their members to bring party policies to the masses in ethnic, unemployed, labor, cultural, and leftist organizations, and had high expectations for the time and activism required. Chicago's party membership grew in neighborhoods where communist messages and activism most directly addressed problems working people faced. On the south and west sides of Chicago, unemployed councils successfully mobilized against evictions and protested police violence. On the west and north sides, clubs supported foreign language speaking immigrants with rich socialist traditions. The largest recruitment in Chicago came from unemployed African Americans on Chicago's south side, which was one of the poorest and most segregated communities in Chicago, and hence some of the most unhealthful healthful conditions. In 1930, 90% of all of Chicago's black residents lived in census tracts where more than 50% of the inhabitants were black. Residents paid exorbitant rents to live in squalor, endured segregation enforced with violence, and experienced the erratic and unjust attention of Chicago's police. Half of Chicago's party identified with a foreign language speaking group. They brought the strongest socialist traditions with them and were the least easy to discipline. Given the demands of the third period, those who stayed, scholars have assumed, must have been the most hardened and committed communist revolutionaries. Some were, but they worked and organized next to others who weren't. 
Whether strict or pragmatic, communists developed successful organizing tactics and, militant, and fought militantly for workers' rights, racial equality, unemployment relief, and against imperialism. Examining neighborhoods and factories where party members operated, these kinds of studies offer the potential to understand the context of party loyalty as well as anti-communist fervor. Local studies ground party activists in neighborhoods, organizations, and workplaces, and help us see how ordinary people became radicalized and what they were willing to do to bring down American capitalism. This direction examines the lived experience of ordinary communists and the effect of their activism throughout the country. A third and final direction includes scholars who call for putting the party story in the life and culture of the United States by focusing on the CP's influence on American life instead of histories of the CP USA. An earlier example of this kind of um, tradition is the important work of, of someone like Ellen Schrecker. More recently, an excellent example in this tradition is Glenda Gilmore's Defying Dixie, which relies on Moscow sources to identify communists active in the Southern struggle against Jim Crow and for human rights. She finds that, quote, black and white Southerners helped forge Soviet policy on race and revolution before Stalin consolidated his power, and they returned empowered from Moscow to implement those policies in the South. Gilmore is an example of a prominent historian who takes an internationalist approach in her examination of the civil rights struggle. In doing so, she joins scholars such as Jacqueline Dowd Hall, who challenges an older periodization of the civil rights movement and brings the matter of social justice to the heart of civil rights history. In Gilmore's work with communists as a fundamental part of this history, the narrative of the civil rights movement is transformed. Eric McDuffie's work is another really good example of this tradition at looking at not only how African American women engage with the Communist Party, but how the CPUSA ultimately shaped feminist politics. Bob Cherney's study of Victor Arnatoff offers yet another example of how political biography can shed light on larger social and political themes. In this case, the international left-wing art scene in the United States of the 1920s through the 1950s, the Russian diaspora, and California public art policies from the 1930s through the 1950s. The questions we ask of our sources are products of larger historical contexts. They're also bound up with who is doing the asking. We should not be surprised that the historians of American communism are not of one mind on how best to move the field forward, but we should attempt to move beyond the binary characterizations of the Cold War, draw and build on one another's research and insights, and ask expansive and timely questions that will serve those students of American history trying to make sense of the nation that they have inherited. The history of the American Communist Party presents an important opportunity to decipher some of the complexity of working class life in 20th century America and to see working people as subjects of their own narratives who shape the larger history of the United States. And also it is important to remember that they did so, as Karl Marx wrote, not under self-selected circumstances. Communists were people of action. They appealed to mothers on the south side of Chicago during evictions, as well as to industrial workers who looked to party members for organizational strategies. Communists drew and wrote and spoke um, uh, in public forums, on street corners, and at city council meetings. They were also loyal to a Soviet system that was authoritarian. Common turn in Soviet is, uh, influence made it even more difficult to at times build an effective radical party in the United States than it might have been without the influence of Stalin or Russia, but it was also the CPUSA's connection to the only country that had staged, the world's only country that had staged a proletarian revolution and the nation that led a, a life and death struggle against fascism that energized so many of its followers. Part of our job is to understand the historical circumstances and personal reasons that caused so many workers to hitch their fate to the communist movement and to avoid assuming that Soviet motives defined all American activism. 
And in the face of international capitalist forces, rising fascist states and movements, and extreme racism, thousands of working people in places like Birmingham, Chicago, and San Francisco made the calculation that membership in an international revolutionary movement was the best chance they had. The Soviet Union and communist policy mattered a great deal to those people, but neither precluded them acting in ways that also made sense in their local union, community, or club meeting. Joining the communist, American communist movement meant accepting that formal policy was not up for meaningful debate at the local level, and that was ultimately to the detriment of the movement. But the party also trained working people to be critical of America's political economy, to see themselves as part of an international movement, to bring struggle directly to workers, to question the meaning of American democracy, and to raise the possibility of putting an end to the capitalist system. Communist theory on race and teachings on gender allowed individuals to imagine a better and different world, and communist organizations provided a structure to fight for that world and a subculture to support interracial organizing, African-American political leadership, and women's leadership and organizing. Unemployed organizations mobilized thousands of people behind the plight of those facing evictions and hunger and trained some of the most talented future labor organizers who helped build some of the most successful industrial unions. In the face of fascism, the American Communist Party recruited troops to take up arms and fight in Spain. The local party also established an alternative social space with interracial dances and parties, clubs and halls, a robust media presence, and a web of social relationships that spun a vibrant leftist culture. Communist activism challenged notions of citizenship, free speech, racial equality, gender norms, consumer culture, employers' power and authority in the workplace, local and state political culture, and routine acts of police and employer violence. The international communist movement was centered in Moscow, ruled over by Stalin, and governed by Leninist principles. But these facts still leave much of the story of the communist experience untold. As researchers and writers on the American communist experience, we still have much to learn about radical coalitions and personal networks communists created and their lasting influence and effect on labor, feminist, civil rights, ethnic group, community health, youth, welfare, and peace movements, as well as on the shape and culture of government institutions and national and international policies. And here I think a dive into the digital humanities would be a welcome methodology to open new paths of study and insights. We have an opportunity to more fully examine transnational, international, and national themes of capitalism, race, and democracy as they relate to the American communist experience. We have yet to bring the complexity of American communism and the experience of American communists to students of American history in ways that will allow us to better reckon with our nation's past and with the institutions, cultural practices, and politics that developed in the context of the Cold War and the vacuum created on the left after 1956. When we do, we will see more clearly the international dimensions of American history and its social justice movements, the limits of liberalism, American democracy, and communist internationalism, and a fuller range of working class and anti-capitalist aspirations and strategies for making a better world through collective action. Thank you. Yes, you in the back. Very <laughs> nice. Um, excellent job uh, outlining the interpretive and generational uh, distinctions uh, among those two waves, those first two waves of uh, communist history that you refer to. But I can think of a third um, that may be important in considering the future of the field um, in that Draper and Hal and Kozer and me and other people we refer to were all writing in the context of the Cold War. Uh, the full expectation that um, around 2017 or so, uh, the Soviet Union would be observing its 
depends at any time. Uh, but that didn't happen. And so for today's generation of graduate students, the Soviet Union didn't exist for the whole time they were growing up. And it seems to me that's in some ways a much more fundamental divide than that which separated the earlier generations. I wonder if you could comment on that. No, I think that that's a really excellent point. Um, I guess, sorry. Oh, yeah. So, um, so what, what Morris is saying is uh, one of the things that I don't really talk about in kind of being an important uh, distinction or dividing line for this kind of new generation and people coming through is uh, the fall of the Soviet Union. You know, and, and isn't that kind of like a big change that, um, and, I, and, and, and of course, that's an excellent point. And, and for me, I guess being one of those graduate students who was coming through is, I mean, I was able to go to Moscow because of that. Um, it's, to me, that's all wrapped up in, in, in that reality. But uh, I think that is something worth thinking about. And so the assumptions that you're kind of going into all of this with, um, you know, uh, are a little bit different. I guess like for me, the, the thing that I'm noticing more is the, the inwardly focused conversation that was happening during the Cold War, like even with the fall of the Soviet Union, um, it hasn't fully broken you know, that conversation that's happening yet. I, I mean, I, I think that there's examples of, of possibility and I kind of hope that's kind of where things go um, but I think there were just so many unsettled questions because the sources couldn't answer it and so it's just too exciting right so now we have these materials let's settle some of this stuff um, but then we're not settling the stuff so round and round we go Could you elaborate a bit on how one gets to these documents that have been released since the 1990s? And I'm sure most people know that, but I would like some guidance on getting to the documents. I actually, that's a great question. And I, I like right now, what I got to do was I got to go to Moscow. And I, ha I should say that um, I was very fortunate, um, you know, uh, it was, right away you know so Jim Barrett was my advisor and he said you can't do this without going to Moscow and I was like I, I don't I don't speak Russian like I don't know what, what, what do you mean oh no you must go and um, I was very fortunate because um, uh, John Haynes was there uh, my first time and he had already begun to create um, like a, a an index to the to the archive uh, which he very generously shared with me, as otherwise it would have, you know, it would have taken weeks and weeks longer to figure out, you know, which files uh, went with which districts and and all that. And um, he had already had a lot of that figured out. So um, so that was uh, really wonderful. But then it all closed up again. So um, but he was instrumental. And and maybe maybe you should talk about what, what the status of all of these files that you worked so hard to get into the Library of Congress. I think that's his accomplishment. Well, in some ways, I think some, it is no longer quite as necessary to go to Moscow. I think it's still a useful thing to do. But the, uh, the CPUSA fund uh, collection at the archive in Moscow was microfilmed by the Library of Congress uh, and uh, was set at the, uh, at the Library of Congress. Uh, the Russian archive retained the right to sell copies, and they have sold copies to a number of institutions in the U.S., including, uh, I think, mean, NYU and a couple of other people. <coughs> hmm? Standard. The Tamarind. Yeah. Emory. Mm -hmm. Emory. And, and probably some of those institutions will actually loan the microfilm. Mm -hmm. um, the library won't, because that's <laughs> unless we have an original uh, 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 negative. We don't own anything. Um, but also the Incomica Project, uh, the International uh, Committee to uh, Computerize the Common Term Archive, it did not, uh, which the Library of Congress was a, a member of, which I was part of the staff that dealt with it, uh, has, has digitized not all the Common Term Record, but uh, probably about half of it, including most of the principal funds uh, that deal with American 
uh, questions. And those are available at uh, some institutions in the U.S. that subscribe. Um, and the, you know, I don't know the current status of the Russian archive authorizing various commercial dealers to make it available. They, there was a commercial dealer who made that available online by subscription. Uh, I don't know if that project can, whether that continues at present or not. But there are still sections of the Comintern archive that you can only see if you go to Moscow, particularly the personal files of, um, of uh, individual. The, the Comintern established files on individuals as it came to the attention of the Comintern staff. Uh, it could be for any possible reason. Someone shows up for a conference, uh, some question is raised by some staffer. For instance, uh, there's a personal file on George VI. Uh, there's a personal file on J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, things like that. Uh, some of these files are extremely useful. Others have one or two sheets of paper and they're not, they're hardly worth any time at all. And they are uh, sanitized. Uh, the, at least that was the way they were the last time I was there the archive staff would go through it and remove certain material. Anything connected to a Soviet security agency would be removed, for example. But nonetheless, those are very useful files. They often have autobiographies in them, uh, written by the person themselves when they showed up for a conference and are very useful. Um, there are some valuable parts of the Comintern archive that were open in uh, 93 to 95, uh, which got closed down. Uh, after the uh, uh, Soviet, now Russian security agencies became authority. Fortunately, Harvey and I saw them first, so <laughs> we're not so concerned, but those, but those sections are, are now closed, and I don't think they've been reopened. But um, there so, is a lot of material available either on microfilm or online. It, it's a, quite amusing that when John and I uh, published The Secret World of American Communism, uh, we reproduced documents that we found that were labeled top secret. And the only reason that we had been allowed to see them um, and to make copies of them was because the archivists had no idea that they were in the archives. Uh, they, they had never even looked at this material. And uh, when we, we published that book, uh, John, a couple months later, was back in Moscow, and the SVR was at the archive. Um, very unhappy um, because while they were perfectly content to have us publish material on the American Communist Party, we had published material that came from the KGB, which was a state institution. And so they, I love this phrase, they re-secretized the documents <laughs> even though we had published them. So th those documents, if you want to look at them, you have to look at our book. Um, Still available from Yale University Press uh, in case you, you want to buy it. <laughs> but, uh, well, shouldn't you also mention the Vasily of the Trojan materials, which are also available online, right? Yeah. A little side note to that is, um, so you know, so they're they're forging the path, and you know, I was you know a grad student woman in this archive, so low status, dark corner. Um, only a couple of files at a time. But I also had to sign away a statement saying that I would not ever <laughs> reproduce any documents um, in whole. And, uh, and then the second time I was there was when the Library of Congress was, a quiet, was microfilming some of the stuff. So even though you know, I was there, they were, sorry, you can't see any of the stuff because we're microfilming it for the Library of Congress. <laughs> John Haynes! <laughs> Anyway, yes. Okay. Um, in your talk, you describe how the Communist Party and the Soviet Union <coughs> are linked. And this is the history that we know. But I wonder if you scholars uh, consider what would be American communism without the Russian Revolution? What can you find out? about the movement within our society towards socialism, toward a, a vibrant communist society without those Russians. Right. I mean, I, so it, back to counterfactual, it's like a theme running through. Uh, we all want to know, what if? Um, 
So, so I, I, don't, I don't know, um, because I can tell you, I mean, I think that the foster um, syndicalist strand, um, you know, a lot of those people who come out of the IWW and um, who are anarcho-syndicalist in their kind of disposition and way of being in the world, at least to my world, you know, Chicago is the, they like to think of themselves as the real Communist Party, um, not the New York intellectuals, um, but these are the people who, you know, th this is where the working class was. Um, and I think, I think that it would have, it would have been more of an IWW kind of experience, but, but I don't know. And the socialists in Chicago at that time tended to be about the words and not about the action. And that was a very clear distinction. Um, you know, so a lot of reading groups, discussion groups, uh, let's talk about racial inequality, um, but communists were the ones who kind of brought the struggle to the people. Um, and that's the kind of stuff, the kind of work that, that Wobblies were doing before then. Excuse me. Yeah. My father was a, um, in strikes, within, uh, a milkman. He was in the milk strikes of 1924. My Where was he? In, in New York. In New York. There was a milk strike in the 20s and so on, the police chasing him and all that crap. But those people were not focused on Russia at all. The, the focus was on the struggles for their own uh, economic uh, well-being. This, this link to Russia is it's natural, but wasn't it natural for communism or natural, uh, socialism to arise in, in our industrial world anyway? I think so. <laughs> um, I mean, I, you know, I think the problem, I mean, I, so I, I, I think of it sometimes, you know, um, sometimes the way we talk about American communism is a little like exceptionalist, you know, like somehow it's somehow a different organization than like we were talking about like the Catholic Church or um, other political parties where um, somehow because it's a, um, you know, because of the common turn, uh, we have to think about it in a different way, but you know, think about you know how you how, how do you think about Catholics, right? So there's people who are making policy. It's hierarchical. It's international. Um, there's people who you know it's it's who you are culturally, but you're maybe not paying a whole lot of attention to this, that, or the other. Um, you you know you try to live your life like a Catholic, but you know. Maybe not like this way, this part. I mean, so I think I think the way people experienced and lived the right. the movement is not necessarily wrapped up in what was happening in New York or in Moscow. But but that's an important part of kind of framing. It, right. it was it was a particular kind of radical movement. Um, the communists that I knew in my time were not focused on Russia, and they were not focused on at least consciously, or even right, on uh, advancing Stalin's program. I, I don't even know how much he was thinking about that. He was mostly thinking about himself and, and his own problem. So I, I think this, we, we are, maybe we're not, I don't know if this what these scholars will think, but the, there was this propaganda during the period of the McCarthy period and so on, as though the communists were the puppets completely um, instruments of the Soviet Union. Yeah, no, I, I, I would tend to agree. That's a really interesting question. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I loved your talk. I really think that it's so important that we reintegrate the history of American communism into a larger canvas of American history, you know, because the context is so key there, and it does get sort of marginalized, and people don't have any rights um, but I guess what I'm curious about is if there were um, maybe a, a suggestion you might have 
this is exact contrast with what where do you think the field maybe should go next? Along with this kind of greater contextualization, you talked about sort of some of the local history, you talked about the espionage history. Are there things, are there patterns that you'd like to see the field go to new areas maybe we could explore or that have been neglected or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, um, so it's, it's a good question. I mean, you know, so I, 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 I don't, I want to, we have a really good conversation during lunch, and so I think these kinds of issues are going to come up, and I want to let Eric speak for Eric. Um, but I do think there are, are important areas coming up. I think, I, I mean, honestly, I have kids in high school, and they come home and they're like, Mom, you studied communism? <laughs> And it's not, it's like, well, it's complicated. No, this is, you know, this is, you know, and, and it, it's so cut and dry, and they are incapable of understanding um, that it's much more complicated, and I think we've allowed that to happen um, as the narrative. And if you look at textbooks, I mean, you can't find the people who we're spending kind of our, our lives studying and writing about that. The story doesn't exist. And you know, in part, is that American exceptionalism? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. But you know, I thought that there was a really, I thought, a great um, on taboos in the journal. Um, and I think that that kind of thinking about um, you know, the, ta the, the taboo of writing about communism in these different fields um, of, you know, whether it's about sexuality, whether it's about race, whether it's about feminism, um, you know, what happens if, we're, if, if in fact, the pe they were communists? Like, what happens if we now kind of go down that road? How does that change the way we understand social movements in America, American politics, American institutions? And if, if we just, try to be outward facing, I hope that um, that complexity can work itself into the larger narrative. Yeah. I was, I was thinking also that, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, in kind of um, a binary terms about uh, immediate demands, uh, you know, at the local level versus uh, politics and, and common term, but there's also a whole kind of cultural uh, uh, arena in which the CP was quite active, and, and Michael Denning in his book uh, Cultural Front uh, addresses that, I think, and, yes. and uh, that's a, an exciting area. And we actually have a dance historian in our audience, and I was very interested in the Cultural Front and its international dimensions, and I said, I don't know enough about that. I really don't. And I know in Chicago there was a whole emphasis on the arts um, on the left, and um, and, and, and I don't know enough about that, and we're not writing enough about that. So I agree. I mean, I think that there's, there are so many dimensions that are unexplored. Um, oh, no. <laughs> yes, Dan. Maybe may this for the last oh, question. Sure. So. Yeah. OK. Um, I think you raise a good point in sort of trying to move beyond the sort of debate in the, from the 90s of you know, was the party controlled by the you know, the common turn, or was it a local grassroots movement? Um, I got sort of caught up in that myself, and you know, the, I wrote an article recently about the Pharmacists Union of Greater New York, and I was, in, you know, I was looking at, well, were they communists or not? And I spent a lot of time on that, and I sent it to the editors, and they said, we don't really care. <laughs> like, we want to know what's going on with the workers. Like, we want you to focus more on the strikes and their organizing, and what do they want? So, I mean, it sort of caused me to reflect on what's most important in what I'm studying. You know? Yeah, no, no, I, li I mean, I, I like that insight. And I think sometimes it's hard, um, you know, I, I know like that I've had that kind of thing as well. It's like, how can I write about this if I don't know? I don't know if they were a party member or not. So I don't know if this is the line or not the line. And, and again, your point is like, you know, it's maybe not what's so important um, because that influence, um, you know, is, is much wider and broader and maybe it's telling us something more generally about leftist politics and its ability to influence or not what's going on on the ground. So, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.